Hello and welcome to another TLDR Explains video. The last weeks have seen the coronavirus vaccine dominate the news, but you may have noticed that we've been a bit quiet on the topic. So let's tackle the issue head on, all in one go. More specifically though, we're going to discuss whether these vaccines are being produced so quickly by cutting corners, and whether they're really safe for you to take. Also, before we start, while we might not have made a full explainer video discussing the vaccines for a while now, we still have been talking about it over on the Daily Briefing. In fact, we've talked about it a whole bunch. The Daily Briefing is our series where every day we give you a few minute rundown of the latest news, catching you up and keeping you informed. You can find the videos over on the TLDR Daily channel, where we also post weekly summaries of parliamentary proceedings to help you find out what politicians are getting up to. Also, we're really close to 20,000 subs, so we'd really appreciate your support to get us over the line. There's a link in the description. Thank you. Okay, so back to the video. When creating a vaccine, there are usually five stages, which in combination ordinarily take over 10 years to complete. Now, scientists have clearly sped up this process when it comes to COVID, leading some to worry about the vaccine's safety. So let's run through the stages and see how vaccines are normally developed. The first stage is the discovery stage. This is where lab work takes place to discover how to produce an immune response to a particular disease. Then comes the preclinical phase, which ordinarily includes animal testing, then clinical developments, which has three phases, including human testing, then regulatory review, which contains all the necessary paperwork and clearance for a vaccine, and finally the manufacturing stage. So you may be wondering exactly how the development process has been adapted to make it much quicker while also trying to maintain scientific rigour. Well, firstly, the discovery stage was sped up quite significantly, made possible by the fact that the virus's genome was sequenced incredibly quickly by the Shanghai Public Health Clinical Centre, as well as the fact that there are so many people working on research around the world all at once. When it came to actually developing the vaccine, though, money was one of the key things that sped all of this up. The Wellcome Trust claims that the average vaccine costs between $200 million and $500 million to develop. However, due to the speed at which the coronavirus vaccine is being developed, they estimate that it could cost in excess of $3 billion. Now, this is clearly a huge amount of money, and when developing other vaccines, companies wouldn't be able to spend this amount for fear that it could lose them a ton of cash. However, when it came to COVID, profitability simply wasn't an issue. With economies shut down and people suffering from lockdowns, governments were willing to pour basically unlimited money into vaccine development. The extra money essentially allowed them to speed things up. Ordinarily, one step is completed and passed before moving on to the next. That's because if they ran steps simultaneously, they could discover an issue in an earlier stage, only to have wasted a bunch of time and money further through the process. With basically infinite money and resources, the whole thing can be run pretty much simultaneously, something which would otherwise be supremely risky and completely unprofitable. When it comes to testing the vaccine, this stage has been sped up too, thanks to multiple concurrent tests happening all across the world, which means that this stage hasn't been skipped and the same number of participants have still been included, just doing it more rapidly. In fact, researchers at the University of Oxford included 24,000 people in the phase three of its clinical trials, and none of them were hospitalized or had any serious COVID cases as a result of being given the vaccine. Similarly, the Pfizer biotech vaccine has completed its phase three trials. They included 43,000 people in this stage, and the only serious side effects were fatigue and headaches. This occurred in 3.8 and 2% of people respectively. So as you can see, the side effects are minor and only occur rarely. So while the testing process has happened quicker than it normally would, that's just because more tests were conducted concurrently rather than a reduction in the volume or thoroughness of testing. And this is where the major news has come this week. It's been announced that with trials completed, the regulator in the UK has officially approved the Pfizer vaccine. This makes the UK government the first in the world to approve it. 
This is obviously big news and kick-started some major jingoism. Well, I, I just reckon we've got the very best people in this country and we've obviously got the best medical regulators, much better than the French have, much better than the Belgians have, much better than the Americans have. That doesn't surprise me at all because we're a much better country than every single one of them. But there is a serious question which needs to be tackled. As it's been approved very quickly in the UK, does that mean that the UK's vaccine regulatory process is less rigorous than in other countries? Well, not really. The reason this has been approved at speed is down to something called a rolling review. This is where regulators run multiple stages of the review at the same time to speed the process up, using a very similar process to the one we explained earlier for vaccine development. It's also notable that despite some people's claims, Britain's early approval wasn't enabled by Brexit. Yet, we can't resist mentioning Brexit even in Covid videos. Now, we'll be quick and get back to the real vaccine news shortly, but let's discuss the jingoism for a moment. The argument is that because Britons left the EU, they were able to approve a vaccine before the EU and any other country. The problem with this is that even pre-Brexit, the UK would have been able to approve this vaccine before the rest of the European Union. That's because Regulation 147 of the Human Medicines Regulations allow the EU member states to temporarily authorise the supply of a medicine or vaccine based on a public health need. Don't believe me? Well, the fact that the UK has approved the vaccine is evidence in itself. We're still in the Brexit transition period, which means that the UK still needs to follow European rules like this one. So this isn't some kind of Brexit bonus like Johnson's described it as. Britain was always able to do this, and that's evidenced by the fact that they're still following EU laws, and they have done it. Now, there is the argument, an argument that we had in the TLDR Slack channel earlier this week, that if Brexit hadn't happened, the UK wouldn't have gone ahead of the rest of the EU. After all, every EU country is approved to move as one, waiting until it gets central approval from the European Medicines Agency. However, this was a voluntary decision. So while there may have been political pressure for Britain to follow, there was no legal obligation to sign up to the strategy. Maybe this pressure would have got the UK in line, but even pre-Brexit, the UK never really thought of itself as truly European, so it's very possible that like in so many other areas, the UK would have diverged regardless. This isn't us taking a shot at Brexit either. People are more than welcome to list the genuine benefits of leaving. It's just an issue when politicians feel the need to make up justifications for their decisions, rather than just sticking to the facts. Anyway, it's hopefully clear that the vaccine has been shown to be safe on many levels. So, we'll now move on to the question of whether you should get the vaccine when it's publicly available to you. Well, as with all vaccines, being vaccinated yourself doesn't just help you, it helps others and the community around you. As the World Health Organization says, some people, like those who are seriously ill, are advised not to get certain vaccines. So they depend on the rest of us to get vaccinated to help reduce the spread of the disease. So if there's some reason you can't get the coronavirus vaccine, you're going to have to rely on other people getting the vaccine. But a huge proportion of people need to get vaccinated before this herd immunity kicks in. The WHO points out that 95% of people need to be immunised for measles to stop it from spreading. And the same's true here. The more people who are vaccinated, the harder it is for the virus to jump from person to person, thus slowing spread and protecting those who can't get vaccinated themselves. Scientists are currently estimating that between 60 and 70% of people will need to get immunised for COVID to stop a significant spread. And the best chance for this herd immunity to be built up is for everyone who's able to, to get a vaccine. If you're in the UK, and our data suggests that that's not unlikely, then in today's episode of This Week in Parliament, we discuss when you'll be able to get the vaccine, the parliamentary debate around the priority list, and who should get jabs first. You can find that episode on the TLDR Daily channel, which is linked down below. So hopefully we've helped to rest some of your nerves about the vaccine, explaining how the vaccine was developed quickly and safely, and why everyone ought to take it, even if the virus doesn't pose much danger to you personally. However, it seems that not everyone's on the same page. There's a few more theories that need to be discussed, so let's quickfire debunk. 
Let's start with the classic. The vaccine is going to be used to inject a microchip into you, allowing Bill Gates to track you or something. Now, while Gates might be heavily involved with the vaccination process, there's no evidence to suggest that this is for anything other than altruistic reasons. Regardless, this theory got rolling months ago, when MIT published a study part funded by the Gates Foundation. The study reported that they developed an approach to encode medical history on a patient, with some taking this to mean a microchip containing medical data. However, anyone who even did the most cursory of research will quickly realise that they meant keeping track of which vaccines people had had by using tiny amounts of dye. If you did do research, you'd also be able to find out that while we do have the technology for injectable microchips, ask any pet dog, the technology for injectable, trackable microchips just doesn't exist yet. Unfortunately, most conspiracy theorists don't do such research, so our video on Gates has a comment section analogous to a sewer. Second theory. When the vaccine's approval was announced in the UK, one of the trending topics on Twitter was thalamidomide, alluding to the morning sickness treatment from the 50s and 60s, which was later found to cause birth defects. Anti-vaxxers have long used this example as evidence of the scientific community harming people with their treatments. But this time, people hit back hard. As Dr. Ruth, consultant from the Thalamidomide Society said, it's a bit insulting that suddenly thalamidomide gets remembered after all these years when it suits anti-vaxxers to have something to compare to. Why is the comparison unfair? Well, because thalamidomide was never properly tested, certainly not up to modern standards. In fact, that's why the US never approved its use. And following the incident, the whole medical testing field was fundamentally changed, and since then testing for medicines has been stepped up drastically. So to say that a drug that wasn't properly tested 70 years ago is comparable to a modern vaccine that's been rigorously tested, well, as Dr. Blue said, it isn't a comparison. And if anything, it's pretty insulting that they've been widely ignored for years until it's convenient for anti-vaxxers. And don't even get us started on the whole autism thing that's been widely debunked multiple times, and yet some people still decide to believe a handful of people rather than the scientific consensus. Anyway, that's all we have time for in this video, but be sure to let us know what you think in the comments. And if you do want to find out more about when you can get vaccinated in the UK and the arguments surrounding who goes first, then check out the latest episode of This Week in Parliament. Click the link to the TLDR Daily channel below to check it out. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we post. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that's in the description.